Welcome back to Light the Fuse. Charles, how the heck are you? I'm doing great, Drew. I, I mean, I, I, as of this recording, the Oscars haven't happened. But I, but I know by the time of this release, they will have. And I'm hoping that I will be great based on the results of the Oscars. Yeah, you got an inside line? You got a Ouija board or a crystal <laughs> ball or anything over there? What a- uh, I don't have a Ouija board, but I do have a Patreon. Do you know what a Patreon is, Drew? No, I've never heard of a Patreon, but why don't you go ahead and tell us? We have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash light the fuse. And if you go there, you can sign up. And if you sign up at the bonus content level, you will get a bonus episode where we dive deep into all the results for Top Gun Maverick at the Oscars. So please sign up. Uh, it's a way to support the show. And speaking of which, uh, Top Gun Maverick VFX... They finally released like a, a few images of like before and after they reskinned the jets. Oh, did you, did you ever see this image? Both here and in my day job, I have been pestering the VFX company since May, probably of last year, and I've said, "Let me write something. Let me have somebody on the show, something." And whoo, it has been tough, Charles. It has been tough. There's been an article, and we will um, we'll put it in our show notes for this week. So if you go to the episode guide, and I'll text you these photos right now. We'll put these photos in there as well. So you can see a before and after of an example of, of when they reskin the jets using VFX to you know eliminate the actual pilot so it's just the actor there and, and, and change the look of the jet. It's really interesting. And there's just one. Is this for the fifth gen fighters? I don't, let me see. It looks like it's, yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh, I'm looking right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm sending it. So I just sent you the photos and, and we'll have them again in our show notes, in our episode guide, lightthefusepodcast.com. Go there for this, uh, go to our, this episode and you'll find, you also find a link to that website. It's beforesandafters.com and it's a, it's a, an article about the VFX and Top Gun Maverick. So we will have that for you to check out. And, you know, the Top Gun Maverick VFX is Oscar nominated. Um, and we don't know if they won yet, but, you know, you know by now. We can help. And, uh, yeah, that's about it for me. Do you have anything? The guy who runs befores and afters is a good friend of our, or maybe just a, a friend a friend of the show, Blake Howard. And they're both Australian. So anytime I run into Ian, I say, oh, do you know Blake? He says, yes, I just saw him in Australia. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. What else, Charles? Well, uh, do you have um, something that you want to tell us all about, Drew? Maybe, maybe, I don't know, if your favorite part of the show? Oh, yeah. I got some shout outs. Let's get into it now. Okay. Uh, obviously, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and his fabulous podcast, My Favorite Album, as well as John B., Elvis Ripley and Suchet. And if you want to get a good look at these fellows, at least some of them, Jeremy Dillon has staunchly refused to ever come on the monthly chat. But again, Charles was talking about that (laughs) Patreon. You can see some of these beautiful people during our monthly Zoom chat, which is only available to Patreon subscribers of a certain tier. And uh, Charles will tell you more about that when we come back. But Charles, for now, let's get into it with Graham Moore Part 2. Yeah, we haven't even talked about it. Of course, Graham Moore is back for more. And uh, he is the Oscar-winning screenwriter of The Imitation Game and writer-director of The Outfit. And we've got and, and a great novelist as well. So if you, we've got more amazing stuff to talk about with him relating to Mission Impossible this week. But you know what he doesn't have, Charles? A, a Mission Impossible podcast. So, you know. <laughs> he doesn't, no. Not, a- Not many people can say they do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it with Graham and we'll be back afterwards. What what do you think is the strongest screenplay of all the Mission Impossible movies? Oh gosh. I mean, it's funny because you it's hard to it's a great question because in some ways, because we know so much about how they're made, we know that like in the mission movies, there isn't such a, there isn't sort of a screenplay phase and then a filmmaking phase, right? It's all sort of part of the same right. operation of making them. It seems like three was the, the closest to a normal 
film production. It seems like, <laughs> right, Drew? If yeah, I, I would I'm say wrong, that. Drew, sure, yeah. It seems like through three, they wrote the script and then they shot it. And that might be the only one where it really seemed pretty straightforward. Two Two's problems happened in post-production, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. It wasn't during production as much as it was yes. afterwards. But. but that one also, they had to shut down like six weeks before to like kind of do a big rewrite and, and change a bunch of stuff. And That's true. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Graham. <laughs> no, that's really interesting to think about because in some ways that would be my defensive too. I know whenever when everyone does their rankings, when when I've heard every other guest on your podcast rank the Mission Impossibles uh, in order, uh, two tends to come up at the bottom uh, of, of everyone's favorite Mission Impossibles yeah. um, as, as it would on my list. But um, the setup for two is really good, right? The sort of notorious style mm-hmm. i mean as far as i can tell they're just sort of borrowing the the setup from notorious you have to go send your ex-girlfriend into this or your new girlfriend has to go into this sort of tricky situation with her ex-boyfriend uh undercover plot and uh that's a good setup that's a really good setup for a spy movie but, like but there's a bunch of two that's great there's just some other stuff that does not hold together quite as well um, in some ways, if the question is what's the best, what's the best written Mission Impossible movie, uh, I almost I want to say Fallout. I mean, I think Fallout is such a, it is my favorite of them. Um, as much as I love the first one, uh, I think Fallout's at least is good. I think Fallout is the one with a real sort of moral and philosophical weight to it. There's this real question of set up from the opening sequence. Ethan hunts a guy who cannot. He cannot make a utilitarian, he cannot do a utilitarian moral calculus. He cannot say, I'm going to let one person die in order to save a million. He's, there's, what's the line that um, Alec Baldwin's character says? There's something about, there's a, there's a deep flaw within you that prevents you from making this decision because a normal human being sh- yes. should make that decision. Yeah. And that moral, I mean, I don't think it's in any of the other movies that you have this, a real weighty philosophical question you know, do we, do we buy, do we believe in a sort of human utilitarianism? Do we, do we think that that's a moral calculus that people should make, that people in power should make, that people who have the ability to save lives or let lives fall by the wayside, should they have to make those decisions? Do we want someone incapable of making those decisions in a job where he has to make those decisions? That's a real set of deep questions that runs through every sequence of that movie. I mean, that's what's so amazing is that then those questions go through, they go through the Paris sequences, the bit with the cop, right? Where she, he decides not to, yeah. he's almost caught by the cop as they're escaping the, the woman and cop as they're getting to the end of the heist to uh, extricate Solomon Lane. Um, I can't think of another one of those movies that has such an interesting philosophical question with so much weight to it running through all of its action sequences like the all the action sequences yeah. have real sort of moral weight to them because of it and most action movies toss off those things right it's always one of my pet peeves about a lot of a lot of action movies sometimes tend to sort of ignore the idea of collateral damage ignore the idea of like well, if you run your motorcycle really fast through a major metropolitan city, you're going to probably cause some car crashes of just random people driving down the street and someone could get hurt who you've never met doing this. Like someone sort of off screen, there could be all this off screen damage that occurs um, of people who have nothing to do with this. But Fallout says, no, we're going to take that really seriously. And Ethan is very aware of all the people who could get hurt like that cop who has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. She's just a random person standing there who could end up getting killed because of something he was doing. And he takes that really seriously. Um, and I think that's so... Sorry, maybe this got way heavier than you guys were expecting it to, but I just think that's a <laughs> level of depth that I don't see in a lot of movies, certainly much less mainstream, you know, kind of action-adventure ones. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I can't think of, uh, I can't really think of any. Maybe The Dark Knight kind of hits on some interesting thematic ideas as well about, you know, um, j- how to handle justice of certain characters. But uh, I think what's also amazing about, I feel like McCory is so great at picking up little tiny threads from from earlier in the series and, and doing this. Because the idea of the zero body count thing comes from the first movie. There's a part where they break into Langley and Cruz like sets the boundary to Jean Reno and says like zero body count. Like they can't hurt anybody else. Like so it's like I feel like McCory, I maybe I'm inventing that in my head, but I feel like McCory 
heard the zero body count idea and was like, that's something that Ethan believes in. I'm going to run with this idea and I'm going to push his buttons and, and figure out how to make a whole movie based on that thematic idea. You know, it's funny. I never thought of that until you just said it, but I think you're right because you do establish that. Um, I forgot that moment from the first movie, but he does. He's very clear that whatever they do, yeah, there aren't going to be... There aren't going to be casualties. Yeah. Well, he still kills people. He's he's killed a lot of people. Just well, no, that's no just the, innocent the, Not people. in the first movie, but in, not in, the, in first, the later. By the second movie, he's By the killed. second movie, he's got guns. People are getting shot left and right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but innocent. Innocent. Yeah. Right. Well, in a weird yeah. way, that's why the second movie is in some ways the least effective. Because he's he's got a machine gun and there's sort of bullets flying all over the place. Whereas he's sort of much more tactical in the later films about exactly who he's get, killing. I mean, even in Fallout, how many people does he actually kill in Fallout? It's well, not... he kills all of, in that same scene, he kills all of Zola's guys or whoever. Yeah, it's like four, uh, four or five people there get shot. Yeah. But not too many. But they seem pretty bad. They've got those, <laughs> oh, they've got sure. those leather jackets. Yeah. yeah. They, I mean, those guys, they have, yeah, they, those guys have I'm a murderer leather jackets. Yes. Uh, <laughs> matching ones around the shoulders. So you can kill, that's, that's different. I'm sorry. This sort of like, the sort of, the sort of, complicated utilitarian moral calculus I was talking about earlier should be set by the wayside if someone has an evil leather jacket on. Yes. I think that, that <laughs> absolves one of any concern for their well-being. Yeah, the, the people in the Morocco chase that he blows up, you know, the, the motorcycles of, those guys are pretty bad too. Well, I, I feel like also from, you know, we, we explored recently in an episode of the, the, some sections of Rogue Nation that were cut out, and I feel like McCory was trying to go deeper with Rogue Nation and couldn't get the movie there. I think even he would probably admit that. Um, but like, you know, there was there was there because it seemed like there was a questioning of what they do, um, which I don't, I don't know if you heard that episode. But like Ethan is like talking to Benji and he says something like, do you ever doubt, you know, the things that we're doing, these missions and why we do them and everything. And that's sort of going in line with Solomon Lane and his whole thing of creating a syndicate and like turning all these agents against the governments who are asking them to do these things and, and you know, kill people or do whatever it is for the, for those governments. And so I feel like he was trying to get there with Rogue Nation and just couldn't get the movie to get there. And they ended up having to cut out all this stuff because there was a whole section, too, about Solomon Lane, like, trying to seduce Ethan to the syndicate. And there was even, like, a music theme for it that I remember Joe Kramer told us about when we interviewed him. That there was, like, a kind of a, I forget what he described it as, but it was, like, this kind of seductive sounding music cue that was, like, Solomon Lane trying to seduce Ethan to the dark side to kind of play on that idea of, like, questioning orders, essentially. Yeah, I, I I have heard that episode, and I think it's so. In some ways, Rogue Nation sort of teases it, and then I, f I feel like I remember hearing you guys talk about the the idea that that the Solomon Lane has the great monologue in um, Fallout. The you know the your mission should you choose to accept it isn't that the line? What if you I ask you have you ever I forget what it is. Yeah, yeah, have you ever chosen not to? Mm -hmm. Right, that's the great line that was. I feel like I heard in an episode of this podcast that you guys talked to someone who was saying that was originally written for Fallout or for Rogue Nation. Yeah, we found it in the script for Rogue Nation. Yeah. Oh, you found it. Yeah. So that's um, I don't when I remember hearing that when you guys were discovering that. That's so interesting because that line seems so. I'm glad he, I'm glad McCory finally found a way to use it because it's so great, right? And it yeah. gets at it gets at the difficulty of you know you're this spy and you get a little suitcase or something that tells you what your mission is. And it gives you all the information at the beginning of here, are the good guys, here are the bad guys. These are, these are the guys you're supposed to go kill. They have this thing that you, we need, go get it from them. And, and it's fine if they die in the process of that. And you sort of go, Oh, well, yeah. Has Ethan ever questioned? It, it makes me wish there was a beat where he actually got a, um, in maybe, maybe with, they can use this in one of the next ones where the information he's given at the beginning is wrong, right? Like he actually does get, that he's given orders that aren't right because the, the IMF had bad information that, that Solomon Lane should have this point that why do you take everything they say at face value, which is this great question. Like, why do you take everything that this disembodied voice tells you on a recording so seriously? Yeah. Which ended up being <laughs> such a great beat in Rogue Nation where, I mean, there the reversal is that Solomon Lane's done the recording, not the IMF, but that's still, which is a version of that sort of twist. Like, don't just believe this because they're telling it to you on a little piece of tape. But yeah, that feels like such a great kind of Macquarie thing. I'm so glad they've gotten to use that beat and can, can continue exploring it in, in the next movies. Yeah. Well, what do you think of the, the, the you know, because I feel like there's, there's criticism of the Ethan Hunt character being kind of thin. Do you feel that that's 
true and do you think that that's a to the detriment of the movies or you know how do you feel about the character development that's in these movies well it's a, it's a great question right i think um so again that's something i like about fallout where you see that he has a personality in the way he's having to make these decisions not to his his problem solving solutions are his personality right he what you don't burden ethan hunt with what the movies or what these six movies have not burdened him with is a ton of backstory and i will certainly say as a writer good backstory is really boring you know you, we never find out we don't know why he joined the imf right we don't know why he became a spy that seems like a pretty solitary life as far as we know from the first movie, he has a family who he seems to be on good terms with, right? He's he's sad when they're... Um... Well, he has at least a, a mother and a uncle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he had the mother and the uncle. And then in the third one, I think he said that his mom is... His parents are dead, although he might have been lying to his fiance at the time. I don't know. Um, yeah, we don't find out a lot, right, about Ethan's sort of story in, in a way that we would in... I almost feel like in a way that you would about lesser movies. What they, what they let him do is you get characters through forward-moving decisions. Like, the thing that tells you about Ethan is that... The thing you need to know about him is, is that when he's faced with a seemingly insurmountable problem, he, he refuses to accept the fact that it's insurmountable, right? When faced with an impossible mission, he refuses to, ex- to accept that the mission is going to be impossible and has to figure out some really elaborate way to do it. And it feels like all the stories, you're just watching this guy kind of go through setback after setback after setback and have to come up with progressively more complicated and elaborate, like, schemes to accomplish these setbacks. Um, And in a way, maybe I'd say that that's character too, right? It's not character in the way of, I don't know, what kind of music does he listen to? Or how did he feel when presumably his father died when he was young, if we can assume that that's what's supposed to have happened. It's character in the sense of, um, you know, I just funny, I always think of like the, the perfect Ethan Hunt and hence the perfect Mission Impossible moment uh, is the one in, uh, in the one in Rogue Nation, with the first scene where they introduce Ilsa Faust and he's in the, he's getting tortured by the guys. Uh, he's chained to that pipe, right? He's chained up to the pipe and she's showing him that she has this key and she's going to maybe help him escape. He's not quite sure. And she tosses him the key and he, there's this amazing shot where the key just doesn't, he's holding the key in one hand and he's trying to reach across the pipe to stick the key into the lock to unlock his handcuffs. And the key just doesn't fit. It's such a simple little, oh, escape would be really easy, but this pipe is half an inch too wide. And because this pipe is half an inch too wide, he had then has to do, Ethan has to do this really complicated, like, he, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like reverse crunches. Like l- lunge kicks or something. I don't know what they it are. It borders on the parkour, yeah. Yeah. I, like lunge kicks upwards up the pole. <laughs> right, he kicks up the pole in this move that I don't know. I mean, I've never been to a gym in my life, God knows. I'm not the person to ask, like, what that thing is called <laughs> that he has to do to get up the pole. But presumably people who are experts in this would know what it's called. And it's so complicated. And you're like, oh, right. This is the perfect Ethan moment. There's a really simple solution to this problem that doesn't work just because the thing is half an inch too wide. And so now he has to do something insane (laughs) to accomplish the same thing that he could have just done had the thing been half an inch narrower. And I I think I would argue that that's character two, that, that like your choices in the moment about how to solve problems or which problems to solve, they are character. They are, um, uh, his, you know, his decision to fall out not to let, um, his team member die and and then risk the nuclear warhead sort of get the plutonium getting out of the open. Like that, that is a characterful decision. It's just not one having to do with backstory. And I almost feel like that's a lesson that more filmmakers could learn that like, you think about it with Batman or something, right? Like, the thing that makes Batman interesting is not that his parents got murdered. It's that his response to the fact that his parents got murdered is to put on a bulletproof suit and a cape and sort of fly around Gotham City beating up criminals every night. Like, that's that's an interesting choice, right? That's a, <laughs> that is not necessarily the logical sort of move from A to B, but that's the one he makes, and that's what makes... Bruce Wayne, an interesting person. And I feel like Ethan Hunt is always sort of 
not choosing the thing it seems like he should obviously be choosing in a given moment. Yeah. And I, we, I feel like we talk about this all the time, or I think about it all the time when I sit at my desk and I'm, you know, working on whatever movie I'm working on. Like, how do you, the most interesting characters are the ones whose choices surprise the audience. Um, you know, we, it's something we certainly talk to about in the outfit all the time. And it's just a tiny movie, but you still have these characters who hopefully by their decisions, the decisions the audience is watching them make over the course of the movie will continuously surprise the audience. Like you're hopefully not expecting them to make those decisions. And then you think back on it and go, oh, I see why he's doing that. That does make, it was a more complicated plan than I had realized that sort of he was trying to do. And I think that's in some ways the character that I think is the, the characters who are the most rich are not the ones with the most rich backstories, are the ones who are making the most unexpected choices from scene to scene. Good answer. I like that. <laughs> we like that he does close-up magic. <laughs> That's character. Well, and God, yes, as, yeah. as someone who loves, as someone who loves close-up magic, I'm so excited for more of that in the next movie. I cannot wait. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge, a huge close-up magic fan. Um, and I, of course, Ethan Hunt would be good at close-up magic, right? He's an excellent, he's an excellent portrait artist in his chosen medium of pencil. He is amazing at parkour or whatever the thing he does to get up that pipe is in Rogue Nation. Oh, yeah. um, he obviously runs very, very fast. You know, he's... Excellent lip reader. Oh, yeah. He does great lip reading. Photographic memory. Photographic, Photographic memory. memory. Yeah, there's some good stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's really a man. Of, he's an inspiration in so many ways, right? Like, I feel like I could... If only I was so devoted, I could probably be better at more things. I don't even know if I'm that good at anything. Like, right, Ethan Hunt is better at anything than I am. Or he's better at everything than I am at anything, right? Like, I don't know how to do anything that well. I can kind of do a couple things. Yeah, that's part of what makes it so remarkable. Would you ever want to write a Mission Impossible movie? Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know that I would. I almost feel like I love it too much as a fan. And I don't know. I haven't been in Hollywood for all that long. But I previously, I the sort of... If you love something, like, let it just be something you get to enjoy as a fan rather than something you actually want to sort of get into the meat grinder in and sort of see how the sausage is made is, I think, a lesson. We thought that too, Graham. And then uh, almost five years <laughs> later, here we are. <laughs> and, you know, oh, so maybe that's a great example, though. Where Do you feel, to throw it back to you guys, do you feel like you appreciate all six Mission Impossible movies even more at this point than you did when the podcast began? Definitely, I do. Yeah, for sure. I like there because there were certain movies that I didn't watch, like especially I think Rogue Nation in particular really shot up for me, but also three and and two as well. Because so I think Drew and I came into the, we started the show because we we loved the first one and we loved Ghost Protocol. That's really what what started it. We were like you know we had such a such a amazing experience seeing Ghost Protocol and IMAX together, and that was just like mind blowing to us. And we we're both big De Palma fans, so we we're like we love the first movie and. It was like, all right, well, let's. The, nobody's talking about. We, were like, we we always talked about Mission Impossible so much. We're like, there's got to be other people like us out there who love this. Why isn't any, anyone else talking about it? So we're like, let's talk about it because Fallout was about to come out, and then we were just so unbelievably lucky that Fallout is as mind blowingly great as it is. <laughs> but then it was like, I guess we got to keep making this show now because it was just like the the obsession is just growing now, you know, and then. Revisiting those other movies, it was, and now over and over again, we keep watching them. We just, I don't know. I, I Drew, I think is the same thing as we're I have a very obsessive uh, personality. Brain, my brain is very. So I'm just like, I, the more I watch it, the more I want to watch it. The more it's really weird. Like I, I have, a, I have the urge to watch the first Mission Impossible movie all the time. Like it's crazy to me. I'm like, how you think I'd be tired of it by now? Graham's regretting getting on this podcast. <laughs> Or he is left. <laughs> no, actually, I was, I was waiting to see if Drew, you were going to say something. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I yeah, yeah. All, of, all, I second all of Charles's weird, uh, weird explanation. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Well, it is. I feel like it's rare that when you learn more about something, you appreciate it all the more, right? Like sometimes when you learn more about something, you like it less. Or sometimes when you, I mean, look, in, uh, you know, L.A. is a tricky place. Hollywood's a tricky place. Like I feel like. I generally have I generally have a good sort of never meet your heroes policy. Like the filmmakers, the writers, directors who I love the most, I sort of generally don't want to meet because uh, the reality is always going to be sort of disappointing. And 
you know, I, I want to have the illusions that I have of these people as perfect and untouchable geniuses. Um, Has that worked for you? Have you have you avoided them? Have you been <laughs> like, do you run away from Martin Scorsese and whoever else when you see them? Do you cross the street? Ran, you know, quickly if you see someone coming, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I'm good. Uh, I can run almost as fast as Ethan Hunt if I see uh, one of these guys on my way. Um, but no, it's funny. It, it's funny I say that, though, because actually one of the few uh, people who I whose work has meant so much to me per the beginning of this conversation, one of the few people in that position who I have met is Christopher McQuarrie. And, and you know, as I was telling you guys earlier, and only briefly, but... It's funny, I've never told this story before, but because this is a Mission Impossible podcast, <laughs> I can probably tell it here. Um, Chris McQuarrie was the first screenwriter I really remember identifying as, oh, this is a person who's a screenwriter. This is what screenwriting is. This person is one of the best in the world at it. And I wonder if I should try doing that too. Like that's a thing one can do with one's life and an interesting thing to do with one's life. And his work had meant so much to me over the years. And then when... Let's see, when was this? This was probably, I don't know, 2011, 12, something like that. We had maybe 13. I'd moved to LA. I had worked alongside you, Charles, at the reality show <laughs> and gotten a couple other little jobs. I was like, sort of not having a great go of the next few years and couldn't get any more jobs in film, couldn't get a job in film at all. I'd written this book that did pretty well and I sort of thought I was going to just I, th I kind of thought I was just going to go write books because um, that was going a bit better. And then I wrote the spec script for The Imitation Game or for what became The Imitation Game. And it was sort of, it turned into a bit of a to-do around town. There were all these sort of people calling and I was I was suddenly very overwhelmed. It was, I think, I had this experience that, as many have, I think, you know, that the, Hollywood's such a funny place because when the, when the sun shines down on you, it feels like you can just, bask in the warm glow for the rest of your life and you never think that one day the sun will begin to fade and when the cold sets in <laughs> my goodness do you shiver right like it gets it gets real cold when when the sun starts to fade on you and I was feeling really overwhelmed you know by the warmth of attention for that script at that moment I think I'd said something in an interview about McCory, just about how much I liked him and how much I admired him and liked his work and, and admired his work. And I got this message once. Uh, I got this message from McCory saying, hey, I saw that you'd said something really nice about me. I, that's really kind. Do you, do you want to have lunch? And I said, oh my God, this is, yes, of course I do. Let's go. And we went out and... Is this after the movie has come out now or is this just when the script was around? No, no, the movie hasn't even come out. This is like, I think we were going to shoot it soon. And I think that it had been announced that he was going to direct Rogue Nation, but they hadn't shot it yet. That's right. They had annou they'd announced that he was going to be directing it, but he hadn't, they hadn't started shooting it yet. And so I was nobody, right? I had never made a movie. I was like a kid with a script. And he still said, okay, let's, yeah, come out to let me take you out to lunch. And we spent, he spent three hours with me. We had this three hour lunch where Macquarie sort of went through and said, look, you're, you're feeling all this attention right now. I'm sure it feels great. It's not going to last forever. And I sort of went through similar moments with usual suspects. And, you know, I'm sure you have questions and I don't want anything from you. I don't need anything from you. I have no agenda here. There's nothing I'm trying to get you to do or not do. Just... I bet you don't have a lot of people in your life who've been through this experience that you can talk about it with. And I'm sitting here, so tell me what you want to talk about. And uh, gosh, I'm going to tear up just thinking about it because it was one of the kindest and most generous uh, things anyone has ever done for me in the film industry. And he, we spent all afternoon and he just sort of, he went through his whole career and sort of saying, these are the good decisions I made. These are the bad decisions I made. He was sort of so honest and forthcoming um, about mistakes he thinks he's, he thought he'd made and things uh, that could have gone better and, you know, gave me all sorts of really practical advice about how to think about not just the work, but even how to have a life and to sort of be a person in the film industry, you know, who doesn't turn into a monster, like how to sort of <laughs> be an actual human being with a sense of a moral compass in the midst of all this. And uh, I, mean, I think back on his advice all the time. 
And yeah, true to his word, we've never spoken again. He didn't want anything. It was just, he was there to be an ear for me to talk to and what felt to me like this sage to give advice. Um, and yeah, it was, it was generous in a way that it is hard for me to even describe at this moment. But I will always, I will always be grateful to him for that moment. One of the few heroes that I have been able to actually meet and had their actual person exceed the image of them that had built up in my mind over the years. That's amazing. Amazing. Did he pay for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> he did, because I didn't have any money, and so it was, it was wildly expensive. So he was, uh, yeah, he was... Um, but, Good you know, question. can I tell you, that was Good actually question. one of his really practical... Yeah, that was one of his really practical pieces of advice. He said, you know, never... Never pick up the tab? No, it was, it was not about the tab. It was like, are you going to buy a house? What's... Um, tell me about your mortgage. Like, don't get a mortgage that's too big, because you don't want to be in a situation where you've got these monthly payments, and, wow. you know, some movie falls through... Because movies fall through sometimes. You think it's going to happen and then it doesn't and you're expecting this money and it doesn't show up. Yeah. And, you know, you can't, you don't want to then go up to do something just for money because anytime you ever do something for money, it's going to be a disaster. That is has certainly been my experience in the years since that anytime you say you're going to do something for money, it's just, it's a mess and you hate it. It's never, ever, never worth it. And he just said, you never want to be in that position. You want to, you know, keep your expenses low, Yeah, live well within your means, you know, so that if some movie comes, falls apart, it's, you're sad because it's the movie. You're not, you're sad because you wanted to make the movie. You're not sad because, oh my God, how am I going to, you know, pay my mortgage next month? Which is extremely practical and thoughtful. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> And we're back. Yes, we are. We are very back. And it's a joy to talk to Graham about all things Mission Impossible. He, you know, hearing him talk about, he thinks Fallout is the best screenplay of the franchise because it has a real philosophical weight to it. Do you agree? I mean, that script is pretty great. Yeah. And what makes it more impressive, obviously, as you've listened for over 200 episodes now, is just how you know, uh, quickly uh, things change and how the script is kind of evolves as they go along. It's just a really, really impressive feat that McQuarrie and Cruz and Eddie Hamilton can can create this story that's so resonant and so meaningful in, in such an unorthodox way, let's say. Yeah. I think, I think in terms of just like a tight, taut suspense thriller, I still really stand by that first movie which I think it's ridiculous for people to say that it's too complicated. I think it's just like just the right amount of complicated and it's great. But I think it's true that Fallout really does go deeper than any of the other movies. And it's hard to deny that that's probably the best in terms of that. Uh, it has weighty aspirations and it, and it, it um, fulfills its goals, I think, of, of hitting that emotional side that, that none of the other movies really hit as hard. Until until part one and part two. Until Dead Reckoning part one, yeah. Yeah, yeah true. We'll see. Um, I also, I loved his response when I brought up the criticism of Ethan's character being thin. You know, people say that sometimes. Uh, not us. But uh, Graham talks about how character backstories can be boring. And he said, uh, you can get character through forward-moving decisions. I loved that part of our chat. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I I know you and I think he's a very richly layered and complicated guy, and I think that's an aspect. We talked to a future guest about how they think that 4 isn't quite up to snuff, but I think that's one of the more interesting elements of that is that push and pull between Ethan as a family man versus a, a man who is committed to his job too much. And right. things like that are really resonant and have been in play since and yeah well it's amazing how too through through all the movies his character seems to be deepening more and more with each movie i feel like it's really it's it's awesome to see right he could have been like roger moore bond territory by now right but he is not he is wonder <laughs> uh, 
just rewarding. Yeah. What else? I also I love Graham's story about McCory taking him out to lunch when the script for Imitation Game became a big deal. What a lovely thing to do. And also very, you know, pragmatic in the way that we love McCory. Yeah. Don't you're not you're not the shit, dude. You have to like, you know. <laughs> He gave him really amazing advice. That was so good. Yeah. And that was at a time, too, that had to have been before. Maybe it was right after Jack Reacher. So it was like he was just McCory, you know, as McCory has said, he was in director jail before Jack Reacher. So it was like right as he was getting out, I guess. But uh, amazing for him to share that knowledge with him and, and advice. And, and Graham said he's done a good job of avoiding meeting his heroes. Because I know that's a saying, don't meet your heroes. But I feel like I've been lucky enough. I've been lucky enough to meet a good amount of my heroes and and... They've all been really wonderful to me, the people that I've met. It's been really great. I don't know. Have, have you met, how many of your heroes have you met and how many of them were terrible? Yeah, I met a si- sizable amount and I don't think any of them have been tr- too traumatizing. I can't think of any, but <laughs> but you know who you are. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're just very lucky, but we've, the people who have been, uh, our heroes have been really wonderful to us Don't, through the show and outside of the show too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, just met so many people who I admire over the years and um, so many lovely people. Anyway, um, do you know what a Patreon is, Drew? We've talked. Have we talked about what a Patreon is? We, I thought we talked. You know, I we might. No, have I said. don't. I don't. Okay, it's a Patreon. Uh, it's a thing that uh, you can that people can sign up for, and it's a way to support a podcast or any other artistic endeavor. And uh, we have one. It's patreon.com slash light the fuse. You can sign up at a bonus content level and get bonus episodes every week from us. Uh, so please do that. Uh, we also have a Tee Public store where you can buy a shirt or a magnet or a notebook or a pillow. I think you can even buy pillows if you want. Who, who doesn't want a light the fuse pillow? So, uh, you know, you got a nice, uh, whatever. Anyway, sign, buy some stuff from our T-Public Just buy the pillow. (laughs) Just buy the pillow. (laughs) T-Public.com slash user slash light the fuse pod. Or you can get it uh, linked directly from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. Under the merch tab. Uh, Also, while you're on our website, check out our episode guide and look at all the show notes for all of our our different episodes. And uh, I got to give a special thank you, too. I want to give a special thank you to Derek Klingle and to our friends from Texas. So thank you, Derek. Thank you, our friends from Texas. Also want to credit our music composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and our uh, editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our intern, Amber Cohen. You know, Kevin writes us music that's too close for comfort in a legal sense, but we love it anyway. And uh, he lives life on the edge. We appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, big, big Ethan Hunt energy in that respect. That's true. Yeah. Nice, nice channeling Ethan Hunt. Yeah. Um, all right. What else, Drew? Well, I just want everybody to follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod uh, on Instagram and Twitter. And to be sure to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And just to tell people about it. You know, we got two movies coming up. People are people are ready. They'll, they'll like it. I promise. They'll at least like 10% of the episodes, if not all of them. Yeah. Right? I think that's a good baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't oversell it when you no, tell No, I'm not trying to. Sure. No, no, no. But <laughs> we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up, um, obviously, in the lead up to part one. And um, yeah. We'll be back next week. We've got more and more. More so and more. Next got, week. Part uh, three. Part three of Graham Moore. A lot of good stuff we talk about next week. Um, and uh, yeah, he he shared a cinematographer with with Christopher McCory. He talks about that and uh, some good advice he got there from 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 that DP. Who, uh, yeah, and, and, and more stuff. Uh, more stuff analyzing the movies. And yeah, so come back. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.